Now may the words of my mouth and meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. May be seated as we turn to the word for our consideration this night. As uh, we look ahead to this uh, coming weekend, the lessons designated for this, the fifth Sunday of Easter now, is uh, recorded for us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 through 10. Uh, so 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 through 10. I'm going to look especially at the first couple of verses, but uh, the whole passage will be worthy of our consideration, so I'll share it with you now. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up to salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of his darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is the word of our Lord. This passage uh, has a common theme of living, living in a true life, a life of zeal and hope and joy. I like how it starts off as it speaks about like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk. Heather and I just had the privilege of having dinner with some friends with the newborn. And uh, we were privileged to see this little one hold, hold him in our arms a little bit and little tiny guy. But this little baby is pretty much dependent on family, especially dependent for food from mom. And in particular, in this case, uh, nursing from mom and needing that regular nourishment on a regular basis. We are chatting with her about how well is he doing at night. He's a couple weeks old now, and she said, well, he's uh, um, made it for four hours last night, so that was great. That hunger, every four hours at, at the max between feedings, more often like about every two hours. That's what it's trying to get at here in one sense in this passage. Have that hunger for the Lord. Do we have that kind of hunger for Jesus? Do we say, man, I haven't talked to Jesus for a couple hours. I need to talk with him for a while. I need to hear more of him. I need to get into the word more. If I don't have more, then I get hungry. I want more. We're supposed to have, first of all, that kind of hunger that we keep wanting more. We should also crave something else that's kind of unique to that newborn and mama relationship. The baby just likes to be held by mom. A lot of times newborns, you put them down for very long and they just get fussy because they want to be held. They want that closeness. I remember when Micah was a little baby in the NICU in the hospital, I would go in regularly and Heather, whenever she could, we'd play tag team and go. And one of our favorite things to do that they highly encouraged was to hold the baby, especially to do kangaroo care, they called it where you just open your shirt so that they can put their little head right against your chest, skin to skin. And that meant so much to the little baby to have that contact. Our Lord knows that we need close contact with him. We are like a little baby that we want that comfort that only he can give. In 
may say, well, it's not quite the same because we can't touch him like that. But can't we? Can't we receive him right here in this supper? Indeed, we receive him into our hands. And if we don't get that supper often, one, we're hungry for it, and two, we crave that physical closeness to our God. There's a special aspect of that that we can only have when we receive that body and blood of Christ. It's a gift from him that he gives to us so we can have this contact that brings us closer in our relationship to him and his love. But this passage doesn't stop there. Yes, we should always crave that. We should always want that kind of closeness with him and that feeding that only he can give. But he also says here in 1 Peter chapter 2, that by it you may grow up to salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. We are to keep on growing and live out the faith that we've received. Grow up into a life that shows we have him in our, in our hearts, in our souls. And to grow up into a maturity of faith that affects us every step of the way. That we want to be living stones that reflect him to the world. And that's the next section. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. What is this living stone thing about? Well, it's one that we have his solid power that cannot be broken by this world. We have his assurance of forgiveness. We have the certainty of a place in heaven. We are living from our victory in Christ. So we have that solid foundation in him that makes us strong like a stone. But not just a stagnant stone that's sitting there inanimate. Enlivened by him, we are living stone. We have strength that can then also invigorate the world around us. To be a living, active witness for him that takes his love and shows it to the world. So we are to be living stones that are working together as a spiritual house. It's more than a building like this. It is the kingdom of God going out into the world and showing his love in the way we act and what we do and how we behave so that we will be a holy priesthood. Priests have the job of making known the one they serve to proclaim him, show him to the world, to offer also spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. What are the sacrifices? Is it offering up animal sacrifices? No, no. It's offering up our very lives to him. Sacrificing our selfishness, giving up our own foolish wants and desires so that we can give our lives completely to him. It means sacrificing our comfort at times. Sacrificing our childish ways that just want things for our own selfish motives. Instead, to freely give, freely serve, and make him known to the world. The last verses of this passage really bring up more of what we are to be as we are living stones in this world. It says, you are a chosen race, chosen by him. Not our own choice that made us special, it's because he chose us. A royal priesthood that we have his divine power, his kingly power now, that sets us above the empty, vain things of this world. A holy nation set apart for service to him, that word holy repeated here again. And a people for his own possession that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I love that word, excellencies. Any of you use that in your daily language very often? What great excellencies. Maybe try that the next time... Uh, Someone in the household puts a meal on the table in front of you and say, ah, oh, what awesome excellencies. Now, it's just a word you think, what does that mean really? It's better than just saying excellent. It is everything that is wonderful and excellent. All of these excellencies of him who called us out of darkness. God is just awesome beyond description, super abundant in his grace. That's another term used in scripture sometimes, the super abundant goodness of the Lord. 
It's more than abundant. It's beyond it. It, it just gets so excited about what God has given us if you really ponder it that it just fills you with this zeal that can't be contained. And it's that joy of rejoicing what he's done every single day. And I like this next verse because it fits really well with our, our life here in Michigan in May. It says, the one who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It's nice when the sun breaks through the clouds and we get some light on these dreary spring days. I know some people have been saying that lately that I've been hearing it from many people. I'm tired of gloomy, rainy days and the darkness just wears you down. Well, his marvelous light just pumps up your spirit, gets you excited. And that's what he calls us to. We're not in the dreary darkness. We are in the light of his love, even on the dark days. And so now we are to make him known. We are ones who have received mercy, and we are to share that with the world. Now, the word mercy that it ends with here is an important word. It's not giving others what they deserve. It's giving them what's not deserved. So we deserve nothing but punishment from God. The world deserves nothing but judgment. But instead, we have received mercy. He hasn't destroyed us as our sins deserve. He hasn't crushed us up into gravel and, and said, you're not worthy to be a living stone. You are just the junk that's covered on the road. No, instead, he mercifully uses us and shapes us and builds us into something beautiful. And we are to show that same mercy to the world around us. So as you go out from here, it's our job then to be living stones who show mercy to the world instead of crushing people under that power we have, which we could if we, took, we got full of ourselves. The Pharisees and Sadducees were guilty of doing that. They started to get full of themselves and they felt the power of God that, that was given to them, true, but they became these hard stones who were ready to crush anything that got in their way. Instead, we are to gently care for people and bring them along and fill them with God's gift that will make them stones who can be built into our house with us. So be merciful as a living stone. Instead of crushing people, shine light upon them. Build them up. Support them and draw them into the building that is our, our living church, our, our holy household of God. And uh, we do that as we continue to crave his spiritual milk, as we come back again to his word, hear of his forgiveness and love for us, as we come to his table and feast on his very body and blood and have that closeness with him again. And then as we are nourished to grow up to a salvation, a joy that motivates us every day to go out as those who shine his marvelous light into the world. So don't remain like a little baby. It's good to have that same craving. It's good to be like a little newborn that wants more food every couple of hours. God loves it when we do that. Unlike a, a mom with a newborn who says, oh, I gotta get up again. Jesus says, yes, I'm always here for you. Come, I've got more. And as we come, he will fill us with more. He will strengthen us and make us strong and firm as stones, but he'll keep us alive so we can be living stones who shine with his marvelous light for the world to see, even on dreary days like we've been seeing here in springtime in Michigan. And pretty soon, the flowers will start to bloom and beauty will fill this world just as it does in the springtime here in Michigan. We can be that beauty for the world to see with his love. May God bless us as his living stones shining his marvelous light with his excellencies for the world to receive. Amen.